Hey everybody, welcome to the Song Revolution Podcast, brought to you by Nashville Christian Songwriters. Nashville Christian Songwriters exists to empower Christian songwriters worldwide. I'm John Chisholm, and this podcast exists to bring you valuable songwriting insights, inspiration, interviews, and just all around good fun with some of the greatest songwriters, producers, arrangers, artists, and creatives, and beyond. You can find out a whole lot more about us at NashvilleChristianSongwriters.com. The great philosopher Plato said, wise men speak because they have something to say, fools because they have to say something. Hey guys, welcome to the show this week. Always happy to have you on board. I have spoken personally with around 1,300 aspiring songwriters in the last couple of years about what we do here in our coaching at NCS. And without fail, every one of them have said the same three phrases to me during the course of our calls. See if these sound familiar. I just want to get my songs out there. I just want to be heard. I just know that God has something bigger for me in my music. Well, you've probably said or thought these things too, as have I. I've come to believe that we all feel this way, especially songwriters. Let's just go ahead and admit to God and everybody, uh, let's just be real here, that we all want to get our songs out and we all want to be heard, okay? Well, there's no shame in that, in my opinion. There's just absolutely no shame. But but why? Why aren't we content to just write our songs, file them in a little virtual cabinet on our desktops or laptops, or stacked in neat little rows on a neat little virtual shelf, only to pull them out whenever we want to listen to them ourselves or with friends in the living room, forgetting about whether or not anyone else ever hears them or appreciates them. Could it be that God is yearning to be heard through our songs, but his true voice has maybe gotten tangled up somehow in our fantasy of making it big in the music world, which is perhaps, in my opinion, at best a false measuring stick for his version of our success. Uh, The last time I checked, obedience to his voice was the real measure, not a famous music career, though there's certainly nothing wrong with having one of those, too. I want to unpack some things around our calling to write for God today, and especially as it pertains to moving from self-expression to actually communicating with your audience, because I find for a lot of songwriters, it's really more about them. It's about their own need to be heard than it is the things they're even saying. But before we get into that, I want to invite you personally to join NCS membership today. You know, one of the real problems that we face as Christian songwriters is we're awful and alone. We, we're kind of in our own little writing rooms. We're at home or wherever we do our songwriting, and we're just all up in our heads, and we don't seem to have the kind of community to support us that we often need. And I talk to songwriters all over the world who are isolated, or they just haven't been able to build those kinds of relationships. So if that's something that is interesting to you, I want to invite you to jump over to NashvilleChristianSongwriters.com and join NCS membership today. It's only 16 $15.99 a month, or if you pay by the year, it gets it down to about $15 a month. So it it's just an incredible deal. I've had so many people tell me that we should be charging two, three, four times that amount because you get monthly master classes with amazing people. I teach um, often, but we also bring in guests, people like Chris Springer. He was an amazing producer. He was with Integrity Music, I think, for 18 years, worked with Hillsong and Israel Houghton and Paul Balash and so many amazing people. And Chris, I think it was our June masterclass, Chris did one on modern chord progressions that was just out of this world. I mean, he, you could see his keyboard. He demonstrated, he talked about different songs and the chord progressions. So when you join NCS membership, you get access to all of the back catalog of master classes. You can't go out and find a world class master class for 17 bucks a month. And then you get other extra articles, membership in our private Facebook group where you can post your songs and meet people and get feedback. And we drop content in there all the time and give you special offers and all that kind of stuff. So just check that out. Jump over to NashvilleChristianSongwriters.com and become a member today. Can't wait to welcome you. I think it's going to be a way to level up your songwriting experience. So join us today. 
So back to the topic for the show today, selfless songwriting, moving from self-expression to actually communicating with your audience. Like I said in the intro, I can almost script the calls I'm going to have with potential songwriting clients here at NCS because we all say it. We do. I I get it. I say it too, that I just want to get my songs out there. I just want to be heard. I just want to use my talents for God. I just know God has something bigger for me and my music. And so where does this come from? Well, I'd like to just fill in the blanks a little bit that, you know, I was there too. I've lived this whole thing. I I got radically saved by Jesus in 1976. Some of you weren't even born in 76. That was a long time ago, 42 years to be exact, Uh, but it stuck and it stuck really hard. Uh, The first thing I wanted to do was write a song for Jesus and about Jesus and even to Jesus because I was convinced that he had invaded my life and he delivered me from all kinds of stupid stuff that you'd imagine was going on in a little lost kid's life, growing up in the era of drug, sex, and rock and roll. And that era, I don't think it's ended in our culture yet, but he saved me, just yanked me right out of all that and gave me a new life. And I started singing my little love songs to Jesus around Memphis, Tennessee and area churches, just fantasizing that I could make a record someday. That seemed so impossible back then. And uh, when I finally got the nerve to send my songs to Nashville, I was promptly rejected and just swore I'd never do that again. As it turned out, it was only about five years later that I accepted a job in Nashville that ultimately fell through and we were left standing with about 40 bucks, no place to live and didn't have one connection into the music business. I got a paper route, worked odd jobs, uh, doing some remodeling and carpentry stuff, and I wrote songs while I chunked papers out the car window in the wee hours of the morning to the rich people's houses filled undoubtedly with successful songwriters and artists and producers and all the people that I admired. Within a few months, though, I was introduced to the now late great arranger and producer Larry Goss by his secretary, Cindy Dupree Holloway, Cindy's a dear friend of this day, and she just begged Larry to meet with me. Thank you, Cindy. I owe you so much, right? And uh, he wound up putting music to a lyric that my wife had suggested, a title for America, God Still Loves You, which became a hit for the singing Americans with Michael English singing lead back in the day. And not long after, I met Gary McSpadden and Bill Gaither, who miraculously signed me to a publishing contract. Well, that meant I'd made it, right? I'd been discovered. It was just a a golden brick road all the way, shiny, you know, little gold bricks for me to walk on, traipse my way into songwriting fame, right? Well, wrong. That's when the real work of learning how to write professionally began. I wrote five nights a week and soaked just soaked it all in like a bone dry sponge and God had provided the break, but that's when I had to go to work. You know, like the adage goes, uh, when opportunity knocks, it's going to be work who answers it. It took me another year to actually learn the real craft and start getting songs recorded. I, I just worked so hard with my new knowledge and had around 19 songs recorded somewhere towards the end of that first year or so. And then I was hired to be a publisher long before I understood what that even meant. I didn't know what it meant. I really didn't. I, it was just like OJT, like just thrown in the deep end and told to figure it out. And I eventually worked my way up to become vice president of publishing for what had become Star Song Media and then moving to Integrity Music where I managed 18 full-time songwriters. And I owe so much of my career and even Nashville Christian songwriters itself to Cindy and Larry and Bill and Gary and Don Moen and all kinds of people and so many patient co-writers who loved me through the process of learning the real craft of songwriting. I mean, you know, I understand what it's like to be outside the Nashville bubble much as you might feel now. I didn't have an NCS in my day to help guide me towards great songwriting. I thought sincerely that pro songwriting was all about me expressing my personal thoughts, feelings, my devotion for Jesus in music. But you know what, guys? It it wasn't then and it isn't Now, I know that's really shocking to some people. Uh, Although my personal devotion to Jesus remains the central cause and the delight of my life, 
What I discovered was that my prayer closet songs weren't designed for the masses. Simply writing from my intuition and devotion fell miserably shy of reaching anyone with anything they could appreciate or sing along with. It was it was really eye-opening to me and frankly quite difficult to understand at first. I mean, if you could hear my thoughts, it would be like, oh, can't they see I love Jesus? Can't they see that I read my Bible and pray and tithe and give and serve and show up at church every time the door is open? Don't they know I'm on the praise team at church? Can't they see how sincere I am? And how called I feel about this? How can they not love my songs, right? Well, of course they can see those things. Uh, They weren't blind to my devotion and my character. But devotion and godly character don't make you a great songwriter. Uh, They can help, uh, but they can't do it alone. I mean, it requires specific, deep, accurate knowledge of how to use a higher poetic language, though it sometimes seems like simpler language, and, and uniquely crafted, memorable, melodic phrases, great melodies to catch the ears and attention of anyone in the world, how much more busy music executives trying to find the next trend leaders, right? It's like you got to walk in with something absolutely amazing. And there are specific rules and principles of commercial communication that we seek to equip you with here at NCS with uh, you know to reach the maximum number of people with your songs, you know, regardless of you know your current context. Learning the real craft of songwriting is how you'll do it, and you'll do it without losing your true devotion to Christ. You don't lose your devotion to Christ. Uh, that's the bedrock, but you're no longer writing just out of that intuitive sense or just, just the desire to share your feelings. I mean, I say it this way, cling to Christ, but use your craft. Few are the songwriters who haven't believed in the myth that successful songwriting is all about self-expression. And I want to talk to you for a few moments about moving from mere self-expression to actually communicating with a real audience. I mean, on the surface, it's probably because that, that we believe this myth because that's what songwriters and artists do, right? They express themselves. Uh, we see the the late artist formerly known as Prince expressing himself and branding himself like so few have done. The Beatles expressed themselves to iconic status as well as hundreds of other artists that we've known and loved through the decades. They did their thing. But is that really enough? The desire for expressing ourselves is inborn. It's innate. It's just part of the human experience. Unlike animals uh, who do communicate the animal world, they of course communicate in many brilliant ways. Take my little 12-year-old long hair miniature dachshund, Emma, who she makes herself pretty clear around here, but <laughs> not with words, not with, uh, you know, not with rhyme schemes and melodies, but we're the only creatures who get to capture our communiques in words and melodies that can outlive us on paper and on recordings to communicate very distinct messages for future generations. Birds don't tweet. They really don't. (laughs) With a capital T. Birds don't tweet, you guys. Go tweet that, right? We desire to express ourselves because we know intuitively that God has created us to use our gifts and talents to communicate something. It's only human to desire to connect with others, and how much more so when we feel we have a great message, the greatest message on earth even, to communicate the love and power of God to others through our songs. But the innate desire to communicate does not itself qualify us as great communicators. Let me say that again. I think that's worth tweeting about that the innate, this built-in desire that God's given us to communicate, it doesn't qualify us as great communicators. Everybody feels this thing, but so few people really take it to the highest level. You might enjoy Andy Stanley. He's a great preacher in the Atlanta area, son of Charles Stanley, who's been at this thing for years and years. And he said in a podcast that I heard recently about gospel preaching, until you are concerned about the guy on the back row who's not coming back or the woman who's finally got her boyfriend to come and he's going to give it one shot, if that image or that person hasn't grabbed you, then you're not ready. Ultimately, this has to be about the audience and not the person standing in front of the audience. 
When we're writing songs just to express ourselves, I believe we're missing a very important and practical point, and that is that our pain, our angst, our failures and foibles can't be all that we parade across the stage if we wish to reach others. Uh, We have to write with them in mind and not just ourselves. We all have pain, you guys. The trick is in redeeming it somehow in our songs by identifying with others in their pain or by identifying it in ourselves and pointing to Christ as the answer, sometimes in obvious ways and sometimes in some pretty... Is it in obvious or unobvious ways? Um, I'm not sure. But anyway, whatever it is, you know, it, sometimes it's really out there and sometimes, okay, it's a little more veiled. Now we'll, we'll put it that way, right? But the audience, all audiences are permanently tuned into the radio station WIFM, and that stands it for What's In It For Me. And any song that has no apparent value for them. It's just going to be instantly dialed out. You're this way. I'm this way. We're all this way. We can't help it. It's just human nature. You can stand up there and say, you know, I wrote this song after my fourth surgery as an intro, but that's a pretty definite turnoff, you guys. Be careful to craft your lyrics with immediate value for your audiences or you will have no audience. Think of songs like In Christ Alone or 10,000 Reasons or so many others that are just so powerful and you'll remember that these songs seem personal, but they're universally embraced by believers for all the right reasons. And remember this, your gift isn't for you. Write songs with your end users singing in your ears. You know, the old way of making it in music was working hard or waiting around to be discovered by someone in the music industry who would hear your greatness, champion your cause, spend tons of money on making you famous and practically handing you the career that you were too lazy to go build or didn't have a clue where or how to start. But technology has just shifted all of that. Now any 10-year-old with a smartphone in Brooklyn or Dubai or Sydney can upload an original on YouTube in the next 10 minutes, go viral, appear on The Ellen Show and The Jimmy Fallon Show for their 15 minutes of fame and get 8 million hits on the video. But things have changed, but most of us haven't, and we still cling to the old threadbare fantasy that someone's going to discover us. But, you know, the new way to really make it is to figure out how to write songs that aren't just adding to this enormous sea of musical mediocrity and get busy building your tribe. I mean, by the time you read this, over 18,000 hours of video will be added to YouTube. And that's not an exaggeration. They say that every 30 minutes, 18,000 hours of music or a video will be added to YouTube, and a lot of that is music, bad music. So will some of that be yours? If you're not a performer, the next task is to align yourself with co-writers who can sing and deliver your songs and build that following that that you need. Publishers and music company people rarely look at anything that hadn't already gained a whole lot of traction in the church or on another media outlet like YouTube or Spotify or iTunes, whatever. So remember... If you want to be heard, learn to write better than everyone else and build your tribe. So here's the question. Are you really good enough? You know, the fourth thing that everyone asks me is or says to me is, I just want to find out if I'm good enough. I mean, good enough to make it in the music business, I suppose, is what they mean. But I've just come to believe that it's the wrong question to be asking. I mean, in fact, it's the absolute worst question you can ask yourself or ask of anyone else because it puts you or them in the judgment seat that only God deserves. So when we come back from the break in a minute, we're going to dig into that question. Am I good enough? And maybe discover some next steps for you that will help you to build the tribe and to adjust your life to become the songwriter that you long to be. I'll be right back. We're going to take just a quick break and talk about something that I think is going to be very valuable for you as a Christian songwriter. So check it out. Do you feel like God's given you a bunch of songs, but you don't know what to do with them? Do you feel like you've got a real call on your life to write, but you're clueless about where to start? Or maybe you've got writer's block and you're wondering if you'll ever get the creative juices flowing again. Well, we've got you covered with NCS Membership. 
NCS membership is all about community and how to grow in this calling you feel deep inside to be heard. We get it. We know that you just want to honor God with your talents and be a good steward of what he's given you. And that's why NCS membership could be your next right step to grow, learn, be challenged, get connected, and ultimately fulfill your dreams to glorify God and reach others with the same passion you feel. It's designed to help you tell your story and to reach listeners who will love your songs. With your NCS membership, you'll receive 24-7 access to valuable masterclasses on topics such as modern hymn writing, worship writing, song form, lyric development, and recording home demos, as well as discounts for other NCS products and a deep connection into a community of creatives who get you. There are a lot of songwriters out there, so you need to be the best you can be to stand out. Be heard and become the songwriter you were born to be. Just go to NashvilleChristianSongwriters.com now to check out all the great benefits of becoming part of a decidedly Christian community of songwriters from all over the world. NCS Membership, your next right step to being heard. Well, I just hope that you'll take advantage of that and check it out. All right? We bring you good stuff here on the Song Revolution Podcast. So back to our episode. So today we're talking about selfless songwriting, moving from self-expression to actually communicating with your audience. And it seems like I and just about everybody I know and deal with have kind of passed over this invisible threshold, if you will, maybe an epiphany or a moment in which we really kind of began to understand that, yeah, we can express ourselves with our songs, but that our most effective songs are going to be the ones who really express the hearts, the minds, the worship of our listeners. And one of the ways that I've said it through the years is that the best worship songs give worshipers the language of the heart. And they give uh, great worship songwriters, give worshipers the language with which to worship God. And I think that's a very important distinction, you guys, because if we're just wanting to get our songwriting jollies out, then hey, well, keep a journal or write your songs and sing them in the living room. But when we're foisting them on our congregations or we're really trying to make people like our songs because we're needing to be liked, I think that our I think that our motivations are just kind of wonky. So we have to be very, very careful about that. I just went ahead and threw the word wonky into this podcast today. Yeah, go look it up. I'm not sure what you'll find, but uh, you know what I mean? It's like something's kind of off if we are writing solely for our own expression. And I'm talking about when it comes to Christian songwriting, when it comes to worship songwriting, when it comes to trying to engage people with what we're doing with our music. And therein lies the rub, I think, in all of this, is that we want to express ourselves. We have this deep worship or these deep stories or tragedies or loss, and all those things are very, very important. But we fail to think with the, the brain patterns of the audience. We're not, we're not in their minds and their hearts enough when we're writing. We're wanting them to accept us and, and our expressions, but we're not really thinking about how to engage them. We're not speaking in terms of their interest. We're not speaking their language, so to speak. And so I, I can stand up in front of an audience and just go off all day long about things that they don't care about, and they're not going to care about it, and they're not going to care about me. And it's the same with songwriting. We have to target audiences. If it's a worship you know, group, or if it's your church, for instance, and you're in a very traditional kind of church that loves the hymns and pretty much hymns only, or maybe it's an older congregation and more and more traditional congregation, and you're trying to do all the latest, greatest hip-hop cool stuff, and they're just not buying it because it's not speaking to them in terms of their interest. They don't listen to that stuff at home or in their car, so why should they have to come to church and endure it? And it can be the, the opposite as well. Sometimes in younger congregations or more progressive congregations, if you wanted to pull out a hymn, then they would rebel against that. So you have to be very mindful of your audience. And it's the same in writing songs. If you're trying to reach a particular group, well, then you've got to tailor your songs 
toward that group and use their language and use their melodic preferences and stylistic preferences in order to reach them. And so you know, when we talk about getting our songs out there, when we talk about being heard, when we talk about engaging people, then there's a lot more to that question or those questions than am I good enough? Uh, that's kind of the fourth thing that everybody asks me is I just want to find out if I'm good enough. So they call me and they want to get on the phone with me and play their songs and have me tell them whether they're good enough to make it. And I, I guess they mean good enough to make it in the music business. But I, I've just come to believe, you guys, that that's the wrong question to be asking. In fact, I think it's the absolute worst question you can ask yourself or ask of any, anyone else because it puts you or them or me, if you're calling me on the phone and asking me if you're good enough, well, you know, I'm not God and you're not God. And it comes down to being about obedience and worship and stewardship a lot more than anything else. If you're called, you're called and the results are up to God. Yes, you work. Yes, you learn. Yes, you invest in all the right places and all the right things. But in the end, only God can send the increase. Uh, my buddy John Mays has always said that uh, our job is preparation and God's job is opportunity. So that's what we do. And that's, that's just how it has to be in God's economy. And so, you know, the real question isn't if you're good enough, especially since the answer is probably no, because you simply haven't done what it takes yet to write songs at the top pro level. It doesn't mean that you can't learn to do it or that you know that you couldn't be successful down the road, but it just means that you just haven't learned and worked hard enough to get there yet. I mean, that's a lot like a talented high schooler asking if she's good enough for the Olympics. Uh, the answer will almost always be not yet, right? So the real question that you should be asking yourself and that we all have to ask ourselves is, am I called enough to fight through all the learning and practicing and never-ending hours of social of soul searching, not social searching, but soul searching. We do enough social searching, right? Soul searching and researching and trying over and over again until we finally start understanding how to be truly great artists and uh, then not give a rip if anyone likes us or our music because we're just doing this for the Lord, right? So to simplify... Am I called enough to learn how to fulfill my calling? I think that's the real question, right? That's the question is how can I move out of being self-focused in my songwriting to being selfless, to take this expression that I long to have and express other people's hearts, try to write the hooks and the melodies and the lyrics that will move them, that will help them to just embrace not only what it is that I'm saying and putting out in front of them, but those things that were, are going to truly call them into a deeper place of worship or to help them overcome you know, a serious setback or a trial or a temptation or uh, help them to, to tap into the grace and the mercy and the love of God you know, right where they are because of your song. I mean, if you were good enough right now, you'd have publishers calling you instead of you trying to figure out how to contact them. Uh, as we like to say, the hardest meeting to get with a publisher is the second one. So you want to be ready the first time. You don't want to blow that chance. So, you know, to hear most aspiring songwriters talk about how called and how passionate they are about this, you'd think they'd be laying down everything to do it, but that's just rarely the case. They seem to all want God to drop songs on them that will make them famous, but you know, it just hardly ever happens that way. Yeah, I guess maybe once in a long, long, long time it does, but it's not been my experience. Uh, the truly called and the successful I know have paid dearly in time and money to learn this craft and then have spent years applying it. You know, true callings don't come easy. I remember years ago when I was managing a particular songwriter at Integrity and we had a bad quarter and he was really, really upset because that's how he made his living. And he said, John, I thought I was called to this. And I looked him in the face and I said, you know, sometimes you have to fight 
for your calling. True callings don't come easy. Think about the people who've laid down their lives for the gospel. Think of Jesus himself, you know, from which we get the passion of the Christ, right? Passion is a price. Passion is suffering. Passion is hard, and yet we don't want to do that. We want songs to just fall out of the sky (laughs) on us so that we can, you know, go tell people how much we love Jesus. But, you know, that's a whole other topic I probably shouldn't go too much deeper into. So, Writing for yourself is fine. You should be expressing your heart to Jesus every day and spending time in the prayer closet, just worshiping and making up songs for Him. Just just don't bring those unrefined, freeform songs out and claim they belong on Christian radio just because you felt so deeply about the moment they happened. That was your moment, honey. That wasn't everybody else's moment. So, you know, devotional writing isn't commercial songwriting. The moment your songwriting isn't focused on yourself is the moment that you're going to start communicating with a real audience. You definitely use feelings and stories and thoughts from your life, but that's different from writing songs strictly about your life that few will care about if anybody beside your mama. Self-focus just isn't pretty in any area of life, right? Once we grow up, once we're more than four years old, you know, that kind of gets old. So why should it make for good songs? When you begin to understand that your gift isn't for you and that the most important thing is to serve others with your songs, you're going to begin to take some traction, get some traction, take some action, get some traction, cling to Christ, use your craft, write songs with your end users singing in your ears. And I just want to encourage you to raise your thinking to a higher level of service and watch as the audience connects and begins to engage with your songs. Remember, selfless songwriting is a key to greater success. So I hope that you'll take these things to heart and just begin to think about the people you're writing for as opposed to how much fun you're having as a writer and looking to get your own emotional needs met by having people ooh and awe over your songs. It's tempting. I know I've been there and not perfect at this yet, but these are the values that I espouse. I want to be a selfless songwriter. I want to be a selfless coach. I want to be someone who helps you take your songwriting to the highest possible level, not for you, but for all of those men, women, and children who need the songs God wants to flow through your life. Hey, thanks for being here today. It's always a pleasure to have you around. Thank you for listening and being part of the greater NCS community. If you're not an NCS member, let me invite you personally to jump over to NashvilleChristianSongwriters.com right now and join us today. It's so inexpensive and it's so cool and you're going to love it. So just go ahead and take that step today. And I also want to invite you to our last Song Revolution workshop happening October 17 through 19 right here in Nashville. You get to come hang out with us, our NCS staff, our coaches, and great people like Kenna Turner-West, who is a professional songwriter at Curb Word Entertainment with over 37 number one hits and counting. This girl is amazing. You're going to love Kenna. You get to meet and hang out with John Mays, who works with Lauren Daigle. He's the A&R guy and founder of Centricity Music. We get to go over to Centricity Music on Thursday night, October 17, and have a barbecue dinner, hang out with John, and who knows who might show up. It's just fantastic. Tom Jackson of Tom Jackson Productions, who works with all kinds of artists, including big, big names like Taylor Swift and Shawn Mendes and so many others. Love Tom. He's just such a great friend to our company, as well as uh, just great people. We're about half full right now, so go ahead and grab your spot today over at NashvilleChristianSongwriters.com. Just look for the Song Revolution Workshop link. Hey, thanks for being here. You guys have a great week, and I'll see you next time. Hey, what a fantastic show today. I hope you caught all the value bombs that were dropped on this one and that you'll begin to immediately incorporate them into your songwriting. You know, you can get even more valuable songwriting tools and inspiration when you join NCS membership. You can become a part of a growing community of songwriters from around the world and tap into some of the most powerful resources available to step you up in your songwriting destiny. Check out NCS membership now at NashvilleChristianSongwriters.com and get ready for some exponential power to help you fulfill your call to write. Thanks for listening and I'll see you next time.